Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this afternoon session. Uh, we're getting started a little bit late. Uh, I think Ruth was doing a fantastic job in her track ran on right to the full hour. It was fascinating. So uh, Dylan and I were a little late getting started here. I just want to introduce myself very quickly before I introduce Dylan. I'm uh, from deep south in, uh, of Africa, down in Cape Town, in the southern tip of Africa. I've been involved in Mortex since almost since 2014, very much as a user and a marketer and uh and uh, really enjoying the, the project uh but it's not about me i uh, want to introduce dylan uh dylan uh, dylan you got to correct me if i get your surname wrong i'm going to say kai stecker yeah it's something like that yeah <laughs> you can Kai stecker. Dylan, yeah, yeah. Uh, dylan's a, d a digital ux and ui designer he's at drop solid a fantastic supporter of the uh, of the motor project uh, and he's got a passion for everything that's both a pleasure to use as it is a pleasure for uh, for us to see and uh, for over the past 10 years, uh, he's pretty much been focused on everything that makes the web better, a better place for users to be, a better experience. Uh, he started out as a front-end developer in a branding agency, and then uh, about four years ago, kind of worked uh, straight into uh, UX and UI. And uh, he's, today he's going to be introducing us to his vision on, on UX and how it affects our time on the web, and in particular, with a focus on, on, uh, on email marketing. So uh, with... The, with that uh, said, uh, let me pass over to uh, Dylan and get out of here. And uh, Dylan, um, I just let you know. Let, let me know when you want me to start your uh, push play on your presentation. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Uh, so yeah, I actually I'm, I I love you know uh, doing uh, presentations in, in a calm uh, uh, environment. So I made a pre-made video, uh, like Robin told you. Uh, and yeah, I'm not going to wait uh, very much longer uh, just to start playing the video for you guys. Uh, and afterwards, of course, I will be answering uh, possible questions uh, live, of course. So yeah, uh, Robin, uh, yeah, why wait any longer? Go ahead. Hi there, guys, and welcome to my part of the day. Um, my little talk here uh, for about approximate 45, uh, 40 minutes, something like that. Uh, you know, to uh, break a little bit uh, from all the technical Maltic stuff you already heard here during the conference, I will talk you through some, uh, you know, more visual, lighter uh, stuff. Lighter stuff, I say, uh, it's going to be a little bit more uh, psychological, uh, as uh, as I can tell. Um, so my name is Dylan Kastecker. Um, I work at Drop Solid, uh, digital uh, agency, um, as a UX UI designer, and I'm very passionate about everything that's very graphic, uh, but that's also uh, based on or stands on the, the right technical um, structures. Uh, I'm going to talk you through some email marketing UX meet points. So uh, I'm mainly focused on websites uh, nowadays. Uh, but of course, also when it comes to email and, uh, and, 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 and newsletters and stuff like that uh, a great ux is also uh, important to um, keep uh, attracting the right people and the right customers for your specific goals uh, so yeah email marketing meets ux is the name of my talk uh, and i'm going over six topics today um, first topic is uh, about me just very shortly i already give a short uh, gave a short introduction but i will also go a little bit deeper in what i actually do uh, second point is why ux so uh, why or what is uh, ux even because i know it's not very it's not very clear it, it doesn't have a very clear um, uh, definition uh, linked to it a lot of people will have uh, different ideas about it uh, or it or have specific goals with it uh, so it's a very difficult term to actually explain uh, 
Um, so yeah, I'm going to share with you my vision and my uh, kind of uh, thoughts about it. Uh, then I will talk you a little bit through some psychological um, uh, researches that has has been done uh, throughout the years uh, to understand how people are actually um, interacting with digital products like websites applications or stuff like that so how people actually behave on the web because based on that we really uh, it's really important for us to uh, keep those facts in mind to build a product that will be uh, gladly used by the people we want to use it uh, that we want to use it by uh, of course we will um, you know grab those facts uh, and try to look at some uh, really um, try to look at my mailbox actually because uh, I subscribed intentionally subscribed to a lot of uh, newsletters lately just to do this talk um, and I will go through some of those, uh, you know, not too long because I don't have that much time, uh, through those, uh, some of those newsletters and just, yeah, look at it with a critical eye and say uh, how we could or how you could uh, improve the UX on those. Then we'll end the discussions with a topic about don't make me think. Uh, I'll tell you uh, when it comes, when we come to that, what that's uh, about. Uh, and then we, we finish the, the whole thing with uh, a little bit of live Q&A. So this is, of course, my, the recording version of myself, but the live version of myself is also uh, present here uh, at this moment. So he will answer your questions um, uh, yeah, when, it, when we come to the end of this presentation. So yeah, let's uh, really dive into it. Uh, so who am I? Um, so like I told you before, my name is Dylan Kastecker. Um I'm 31 years old. Let's see, I'm a music enthusiastic, uh, enthusiast, sorry. Uh, I love vinyl, I love all sorts of music. I also uh, play in a, in a rock and billy band, uh, rock and billy slash blues band. So yeah, music is a great passion of mine. But since 2009, I'm also very, um, how must I say it, um, addicted to everything what's going on on the web. Uh, so in 2009, I started learning some HTML and uh, started to use, you know, program software like uh, Photoshop, InDesign, stuff like that. Um, and then I started uh, to work uh, at, an, at a branding agency as a front-ender for seven years. Um, so uh, I learned a lot of stuff over there and learned to, to build a very um, interactive websites, very beautiful designed websites, uh, you know, handed over by very good designers. So that's why I got more and more passionate about design. So I left that job and just became a full, um, uh, you know, full-time designer. So, um, yeah, I really, like I said, like I said, of course, design is a huge part of my life. Um, and I, you know, really want my front-end experience to be used uh, by me when I'm creating my products and want to uh, hand my products over to other people like clients or colleagues or for, yeah, developer colleagues, of course, so that I don't create stuff that isn't really um, uh, possible to create, which is, of course, very important. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm passionate about everything that helps a person reach their goals on a digital level. So the second topic, and now we're really getting, getting to it, uh, the real stuff, uh, why UX, um, why is UX so important or maybe what is UX? So. Uh, when I started off as, as a designer, I got more and more interested in, of course, UI design. But apart from that, a huge interest of mine, which is which you should have as a web designer, in my opinion, uh, is of course um, the UX part of it all. You know, the like I said, the psycho psychology behind designs, behind ways of surfing through stuff, 
looking through digital pages uh, or even like uh, like uh, you uh, your interest uh, email templates or emails um, so yeah I think you can only build a beautiful product when the product is useful and can be used as quick and as smooth as possible by the people you want to use it uh, that you want to use it that you want that use it sorry uh, but like I said, it's not an exact uh, science. So for myself, I actually have this short list of, uh, of questions to describe what a usable product looks like. Um, and it's just, this, this is a list of uh, six questions that I actually like to ask myself every time I created a sort of uh, design for a page, uh, for a web page, uh, and I want to present that over uh, to other people I go over this list and if the answer is yes on, on all of these questions I know that my product you know has already a good UX base so the questions I ask myself of course is a product useful um, is it learnable so can people figure out how to use it um, and is it easy to figure out how to use it can it you know come by itself uh, without you reading too much of it, instructions and stuff like that isn't m memorable. Um, do people have to relearn to use it each time? So have they? You know, uh, imagine you go to a certain um, web page and you're like uh, uh, you're like searching uh, for a specific kind block of. Of, of content and at which you have to uh, to fill in a form or something to become other content on that web page if the form is for example is too too difficult in use uh, you will learn to use it when you are uh, of course um, uh, uh, sorry you will learn to use it once you you start using it but if you have to relearn it once you get back to that specific page and you have to find your way back to that page all over again it's not a very good product. You have to make sure that people re can remember uh, fast and learn to, to, uh, to use it fast. Uh, and sorry, it's seven questions, not six, as I see it here. Uh, is the product effective? So does it get the job done? Is it efficient? Does it get the job done within the sufficient, uh, efficient amount of time and effort? That's a very, very, very um, important uh, uh, focus point, actually. Uh, within UX because people never have enough time to accomplish uh, their needs. Um, they really want to get stuff done in a very, very short amount of time immediately. You know, they don't want to put effort into it. That's something you have to remember. Is it desirable? Do people want it? And is it delightful? Um, is using it just fun? Is it nice to use it? Do I feel right when I use a sort of product or when I use a sort of uh, when I, when I use this sort of email or read a sort of newsletter, does it feel right for me? Can I connect myself with the product? You know, does it look nice, of course, as well? Does it, does it have a nice interface? All uh, these seven questions really are, um, yeah, are there to, to test the very basics of your product uh, when it comes to UX. So how we really use the web. So we know what the right questions are to ask yourself when you're building a product, an email, a website. But what we have to know is some facts that we already discovered in the past or other people uh, researched for us, uh, UX researchers. Uh, so we know how people, how, how, how people use products on the web already. The first one that's very important as well is we don't actually read pages we tend to scan them. So if you have, for example, a page with a lot of text or, or even a news article, it doesn't have to be a web page, with a lot of text, we only are going to read the full text when we're actually interested in the topic. If not, we were just, we, we're just about to, uh, to read the, the titles and the subtitles and everything that pops out from it. So that's something as designers we have to make sure that people can search for those things that pop out. That's what we call hierarchy. We have to make sure the content has a good hierarchy. 
you can play around with typography, but also with color and stuff like that to make things more important than other things. So, uh, like I said, uh, it's well documented that users uh, st tend to spend very little time on reading, you know, with these scan pages and looking for phrases or titles that catch our eye. Uh, except if we choose uh, if we choose a topic that we're really interested in, uh, what we see when we look at pages at a page depends on what we have in mind. And it's usually just a fraction of what's there. Everything goes very quickly. A user already tests within a second or maybe two seconds if something is right for her or him. If not, the user will leave. And you have to make sure that the user stays where he has to stay at that uh, specific kind of moment. So why do we do it actually? Why does that happen? Why do we scan uh, content uh, or uh, emails or, or pages or magazines? Because we're usually on a mission, we want to get something done quickly, like I said. We actually tend to act like sharks. I really love this statement. Uh, we have to keep moving, we have to keep reading, we have to keep scanning or else we'll die. Uh, we don't know, uh, sorry, we, don't, we know we don't need to read everything. We know that, you know, if it doesn't interest us, we don't have to read it. The rest is irre irrelevant. Uh, we are just good at it. So like I told you before, throughout history, um, already 60 years ago, for example, we already have been scanning through everything that was printed out, uh, but also on social media, uh, for example, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Wall, stuff like that. We're scanning the whole day through. The very second point is we don't make optimal choices. We satisfy, and I wanted to go a little bit deeper into the term satisfying. What is satisfying? We tend to assume that users will scan the page, although, uh, sorry, we tend to assume that users will scan the page and consider all of the available options and choose the best option. So we tend that users are going to put some effort in deciding what's important and what's not. Put those options together and choose the right option. No. That takes way too much time. In reality, most of the time, we don't pick the best option, but we pick the most reasonable and the quickest option available for us. And that's a strategy we call satisfying what everyone does, actually. Although you are um, you know, uh, conscious of it or not. As soon as we find the link that seems to fit our needs, there's a big chance we'll click on it. Otherwise, we might leave. Why don't we always choose the best option first? Why don't we put our time and effort in just choosing the, the right option? Won't that be quicker? No, not th that is not what our brain thinks or what our instinct thinks. We're usually in a hurry. Optimizing is hard and it takes a long time. Uh, doesn't, if, you, if, you, if you pick the wrong option, uh, it doesn't really uh, have consequences. You can still go back. Um, uh, and guessing, it's just way more fun than weighing options, you know, weighing options sounds or might seem a little bit administrative while guessing stuff and just clicking around might seem like the, the quickest uh, option. That's why we do it. And third third uh, um, point is we don't figure out how things work, we muddle through. Muddling through, what do I mean by that? Well, we use um, products all the time without understanding how uh, they actually uh, yeah, work or how it actually asks or what it actually asks asks for us from us to do with it um, you can compare it by imagine you're buying a, a coffee machine um, so you buy a coffee machine it's a whole new device you don't know how it works yet and yet you won't read the full manual first. No, you'll try using it yourself because you think the product should, should be a little bit self-evident uh, uh, in using. That's what I do all the time. I will start, you know, uh, you, pressing buttons, uh, um, sliding things uh, in, in, an, in another position till the, the product does what I want. Uh, that's muddling through uh, rather than reading the full manual first and just know already what to do. Uh, so we muddle through and we're making up our own stories about what we're doing and why it works. Uh, a lot of people use software, websites and consumer products effectively in ways that are nothing like what the designers intend it to work like. Um, so most of the time designers overthink products in a way that they think that a user might use it 
but a user just wants to do it quickly and wants to muddle through, uses it wrong. And if the user becomes the right goal, the goal the product uh, was intended for, he will stay. If not, the user will most of the time uh, leave your product. Why? Why does this happen? It's just not important to us. We don't have to understand everything we use as long as it works. If we find something that works, we will stick to it. Once we find out that something works, uh, no matter how we had to muddle through, we will memorize it and we'll get back to the product. Very important point as well to uh, remember. Number four, ways to improve your emails. Okay, so now, now that we all know those, those facts, there are way more facts, of course, but as we have a time specific time limit here, I can't go uh, through all of them. Uh, of course, it would be endless to do. Um, but now that we know those facts and we look at some existing uh, newsletters that were sent to my inbox, we could, you know, pick out some of the mistakes that were made. And you will see why in a moment. Avoid, if, if you want, for example, of course, we want to send out a very um, uh, scannable news, uh, newsletter with content that, that has to be, that's important for a, for a wide range of, of people. It's very important that we, um, first of all, try to decide, or not try, that we decide to make a newsletter that avoids uh, to make a user think, but that's able to, uh, for the user to absorb the information quickly. Right. So that's why I wrote down avoid things that make us, makes us, make us think. So how can we do that? Yeah, like I said, create, create a hierarchy, make things pop out that are more important, you know, just make sure they can scan the page uh, in an efficient uh, way. Break emails up into clear defined areas, make it obvious what's clickable, very important. Uh, I've seen throughout my examples, uh, which I will show you in a, in a minute, I've seen some, uh, some stuff that's really not obvious to click on and people won't click it. So you will miss a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, traffic to your specific goal. Uh, format content to support scanning, what I said before, and make things as self-evident as possible. So that can mean, what, what I mean by that, is actually what I see a lot is that certain instances or companies or, yeah, whatever, uh, you know, companies, let's say companies, uh, use terms in their content, in their communication, that it's uh, known by the people working there or by the company itself, but not um, by the people you want to read it, that you want that read it. Uh, so they use like technical um, labels and stuff and, and technical uh, terms, but you, you don't have to do that. You really have to um, put yourself in the shoes of the ones who will read your newsletter and you have to explain things as possible and as powerful as possible. Uh, avoid making users think about things that users shouldn't spend their time thinking about. Where should I begin? Where did they put? What are the most important things? Why did they call it that? Shouldn't be questions a user, a user would have to ask when he's reading your newsletter. Serve the readers quickly, serve the customers quickly. Um, make sure that the email loads uh, and, uh, at a reasonable amount of time by keeping your images uh, quite low in, in, the, in file size. Um, minimize your code, like write your styles in line. Um, don't write separate CSS styles, write it in line. That's what an email expects. It's still to these day expect, expects um, um, code, HTML code that was written back in the nineties, you know, tables and inline styles. Make sure that there isn't unnecessary code, you know, that the code can, is only there to be used because that will ask more time from the server to load. Make your template more mobile friendly as, as well. I still see a lot of templates that, that you have to zoom in in order to read on a mobile device. No, because it will 
load too, yeah, won't load good on a mobile device. It will load sort of desktop version. We don't want that. We don't. We want to make it responsive and make it look good on mobile devices as well, especially in uh, 20, 2023, of course. And also don't forget to write an appealing subject line in pre-header text. This is very important because um, this is one of the first, um, th no, not one of the first, this is the first contact a user will make with your email. He will see a preview text and a subject line uh, in a, in in his or her uh, inbox. Uh, so make sure that's obvious and that you can build a sort of trust with, the, with that potential customer and that he really is interested to click on and read, uh, read further. Get to the point quickly by serving succinctly and clearly content. So the content, what I mean by this is, excuse me, is that the, the content itself, we might not forget. So we, we might think about hierarchy and clickables and, you know, images. But of course, the content itself also has to be very uh, clear to, to someone who's interested in and has, has to uh, obtain the right uh, words and ways of explaining stuff, you know, has to drag the user into it. Um, and of course, Make it scannable. Don't forget the scannable. It's, it's very important. Accessibility, of course. Don't forget it. What with uh, dark modes and stuff like that, and color contrast can can help with that. Uh, but also fonts, uh, you know, font families, uh, call to actions that you can make more prominent. You know, the hierarchy thing again. Also important stuff to remember when you're um, uh, making a, 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 for example, a, a nice a newsletter. So what did I see in my mailbox now? This is the, the interesting and the fun part to, to show you. Excuse me. For example, this, um, you know, um, I can't remember what it's about. It's, uh, ah, it's about doing it yourself at home stuff, you know, uh, some, some, some little maintenance works you have to do at home. Uh, to do it yourself and what i see here what i think is what that lady over there thinks what the hell uh, is important here what the hell is important you know we, we have one two three four five options that seem equally important here which cannot be the case you know i'm not interesting in all of interested in all of that and you can't really overload a customer potential customer or a user or a reader with too many options because it will be too much to the mind and the user might think well oh no this is too much i'm i i, I have to leave so we, what i'm talking about are the, the five call to actions here three green call to actions and two orange call to actions it's yeah why not dividing it in in some hierarchy you know for example uh Watch our video if you have a nice video about uh, that explains your company and, and the goals you want to uh, yeah, you, you strive for. Uh, why not making that more prominent and making the rest a little bit more um, uh, sub, uh, you know, um, secondary, so that people might watch your video and know a little bit more about your company, for example. But not placing five call to actions at once. It's too much for the user to capture. But what I told you before as well, uh, this is a, an email template um, or, or newsletter for uh, carnival uh, clothes, you know, party clothes and stuff like that. And what I see here is a lot. I see a lot as a, as a user, as a reader, uh, and I might be interested in, in ordering a new uh, festival suit or something. Uh, but what I see here is a lot you know i see stuff about makeup i see stuff about net shirts i see pink colors blue colors purple colors gray colors i see i just see too much and i'm not sure if i want to invest my time in making a good option here for me for example i'm interested in festival outfit ideas and i think they have to look at themselves and think like 
what is actually what 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 is the goal of our newsletter what what do we want people to do here you know we can't make people do everything no what do we want most of all if this company would hire you some festival uh, outfit ids for example make that prominent make the, the rest a little bit more quieter and easier it will be better for for everyone uh, more important, this is a lot and I don't know what to read, but I also don't know what to click on. What is clickable here? Is the makeup uh, clickable? I think so, though I'm not sure. Is the net shirt clickable? Are the prices clickable? Is there a button here? I, I, I have the feeling I can't click on anything here. And it is the case, I could actually click on the makeup here, for example, and on, on the festival outfit IDs. No, please give the user some options to click on, you know, give the user uh, a clear call to action if you want them to do something. Another example here in this newsletter is, yeah, okay, they want to, to tell the user a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a flower company and they, they uh, send you some bouquets and stuff like that. And I might think that uh, as an owner of such a company, you have a lot of images you know, nice images of nice bouquets, which you can uh, use as a sell point for a user. But they chose to use very much text here as a sell point. Very much text and kind of the same font size, um, which, you know, um, results in me not wanting to read all of those texts and might skip this email. What is important here? What do you want me to do as a user? Okay, here is, here is look at this bou bouquet is a call to action, okay? I see the picture, okay? But I want to know a little bit more about the picture. It's just too much text to read. I won't read it. I, have, I need some, some words to pop out here, some, some nice title that tells me a little bit more in a textual way about the bu bouquet. So... That's it's very shortly uh, some examples I, I shown you, I've shown here because, again, I don't have that much time. Uh, might consider to record a fuller video to send you some time, but I, know, I don't know if I'm, I will have uh, enough time to do that. But the fifth point here is don't make me think. And I kept this topic as a kind of a, a surprise for you, well, though, which, which I will explain you now. So... All the stuff I, I told you is really, I, I learned the most of it uh, by reading uh, this book, Don't Make Me Think, by my UX or usability guru, Steve Kruk. And I, I think, I actually hope, a lot of you guys will already know this book uh, and have read it. So you will know a lot of stuff I told you here in this, uh, in this short call. But if not, please read it because there's so much more about, to say about UX on very different sort of uh, media that can be very interesting for you as a web designer. So read this book. It was firstly um, brought out, I think, at the beginning of the 2000s. Yeah. And then 13 years later, in 2013 or something, he made a revisited uh, kind of book, which uh, focuses more on mobile, of course, the stuff that wasn't there um, in, uh, in, in, at the beginning of the 2000s, you know, social media, stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, very, very, very good book. If you, have to st you want to start reading some stuff about UX, please choose this book by Steve Kruk. Who is this guy, Steve Kruk? Why, why do I tell you to trust this guy and trust the things he's saying? It's because he's a very respected usability or UX researcher for years, people. Um, he has researched dozens of products in his career. He has written the book and every self-respecting web, respecting web designer knows about the book. Don't worry if you don't know it yet, you will know it now. Please read the book. Um, what is... Uh, let's let's end my talk here with a, a, a powerful quote quote by uh, Steve, um, which I take with me uh, through most of the projects I do because I love this quote. A person of average or even below average ability and experience can figure out how to use the thing to accomplish something without it being more trouble 
than it's worth. Good job, Steve. Very nice quote. Very nice man. Very nice book. So yeah, folks, that's all. I know it was a little bit short and I had to speed over stuff uh, to stay within time. But I hope it more, it, it's been uh, a little bit of a, a learning um, a little bit of a learning journey you, you, I gave you here and you might pick out some stuff of it, uh, pick up some stuff uh, of it uh, and try it in your own work whenever it's uh, making websites, uh, making uh, marketing automation, automation flows, uh, which of course will live through newsletters and, and emails sent to uh, potential uh, customers. Uh, yeah. To, shortly said that it's just been useful to you to use so yeah that was it we m will end the, the discussion or the call here with a, a short q a which the live version which i already told you is also present here will uh, uh, ask uh, answer your questions uh, in of course thank you very much uh, for listening to my uh, to this and I wish you all the best further on the conference and uh, wish you all the, the love and peace and Maltic fun uh, further on. Thank you very much guys. Thank you. Dylan, thank you so much. That's uh, we're, we're hang of an informative. Uh, I've got a couple of questions uh, that I'd like to ask you before I kick off on that though, I just a slight different topic. Um, how can we hear more of your band's music? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, we're yeah, we don't have a website yet. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit, a bit ironic because I'm talking about UX and stuff, but I haven't built a website yet because we're uh, pretty young. Uh, but we're mostly on uh, Facebook now. We're called uh, the Uppercuts. The Uppercuts. We'll check as, <laughs> yeah, yeah. as a as a fellow audiophile. I'll I'll have a look. I thought that was that was great. <laughs> All right. But yeah, right. thank you, thank you so much. Um, I kind of uh, I want to kick off with the with a with an interesting question, uh, which I actually ask quite often of designers that I work with. And um, let me actually I'll bring the question up on on screen shortly. But the the question is is what is the role of design in an email context when we're we're doing kind of one to one style emails that are delivered by automation? They're delivered in a drip campaign format. That's quite common with Mortic as opposed to kind of a broadcast newsletter style. I know, for example, if I get a if I get a sales call, the first thing I know I'm going to be pitched as a sales call is the person will go, "Hello, how are you?" None of my friends phone me and start the conversation with, "Hello, how are you?" And the same token, when I get an email that's heavily designed and there's a lot of HTML and colors and things that I know straight away that this is a sales email. Of course, if it's a you know if it's a product I like and whatnot, I'll look at it. But often that kind of brings up a a knee jerk response to go, ah, "Don't try and sell me anything." And I'm curious how design fits into, into that one-to-one -one environment. Um, you know, that, 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 more, that a lot of us using more tech are often sending emails in that in that fashion. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a great question, actually. Uh, well, for me, it that already starts actually on the website itself because that is the, the start point of that all. You, you want to, uh, of course, uh, um, receive your input uh, from a user over there. So I see it as a as a story that starts in the website. Uh, yeah. In the, in the website phase that goes on to in the email uh, flow, but actually the personal aspect, I'm guessing you're talking about a uh, sort of uh, personal uh, communication you're trying to achieve with a, with, a, with the users. I try to, I tend personally, um, uh, my way of working is to, uh, to, to try to achieve that through my web design already as well. And actually the email, uh, uh, email campaign or the email template kind of flows out of that. Um, of course, it's, it's pretty client based. It, it depends on, on the type of client you're working on, but a personal, uh, yeah, personal uh, way of working or, or uh, tactic uh, always works for me. And not always, not only in, in, in the way I deliver the content or, or I do, I do not deliver the content of course, but uh, mostly, um, yeah, how must I say it? I kind of try to, um, I cannot say I don't write copy. I try to uh, add as much copy already in the designs um, uh, before we uh, yeah, 
pull uh, put a copywriter on the project, I tried to already uh, put down the first steps into writing the good copy that fits my uh, design. So yeah, for me, it's actually a, per a personal trip. Uh, I try to uh, you know um, yeah uh, lead the user through from point A to to Z, to Z actually. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Because question. Yeah, I think it does. Th thanks, thanks very much. I think I think a follow-on question from there would be, um, you mentioned the, the use, you know, users, you know, having a personal journey. Obviously, often what we think is good, a good personal journey for a user is not what the user thinks it might be. You know, when you've got a sample, a test case, a, a test group of one yourself. Uh, I know in my case, I often get that wrong. Do you? How do you go about? kind of user testing and, and what are you focusing on when you do user testing? Yeah, well, first of all, of course, we we do a design intake with the customer. So at, that's about two or four hours, uh, maybe. We sit down with the customer and we try to ask them some personal questions about uh, their company and what they want to achieve with the company, what they don't want to achieve with the company, what they want to achieve with the website itself, like just more focusing on the website, what they want to achieve with uh, marketing uh, automation or, or, or emailing. Uh, we start on from there and then we actually kind of stop uh, at the end of the wireframe phase. So I'm very fond of uh, doing user testing uh, in context of, of, of wireframing. That means uh, I want to challenge myself uh, doing user testing before I really uh, put wrap a jacket uh, onto uh, my wireframing, uh, just to see already in that stage how a user actually uh, reacts on on you know, the things they see, and of, of course the 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 yeah the way I I really love to do it is 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 live at our office, uh, but that of course depends on the budget uh, of uh, of the client, uh, how much how much budget do they want to uh, put into. Uh, user testing but that's our most expensive uh, option is that the, the yeah we we invite some some people we know maybe some someone from uh, our our, our uh, friends surrounding or, or or families but maybe uh someone um in the building from another company whatever we we really uh invite those people here and try to make them uh try to test, make them test uh, our wireframes, you know, uh, because we make our wireframes also into, yeah, we tend to make a, a clickable mockup out of that. And then you can, yeah, you can really detect most uh, uh, issues um, or, or uh, you know, gaps into your process. And it's not, it's not too late to, uh, to make some change because you can imagine if you have already uh, created your, your visual design uh, yet, yeah, of course, cost you more time and and more effort to to uh, to to change that uh, when you're in that stage. So that's how we do it, or we tend to do it. Of course, a cheaper way is is yeah that we we quickly let some people in the office here uh, test uh, the wireframing. Um, but yeah, that's sadly enough. That's the way uh, we we have to use the most because we we are trying to. Yeah, to implement user te live user, user testing more and more here uh, at uh, Drop Solids, uh, we're kind of looking for a, a good way to do that. Yeah. So sounds like the takeaway is that it, at least try and get someone other than yourself to to have a look at what you pulled together. Of course, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. and also other, of course, teammates who are uh, yeah, who are working on the project, uh, or even uh, other designers because we have, yeah, a, a different sort of eye to look at that stuff. Of course, yeah. Fantastic, thanks, thanks, Zilla. We've got we've got a question from from uh, from Hugo. Let me show this question on stage. Um, and uh, there it is. There, I think it's a very practical question. You know, how would you make a news article more clickable with a call to action? Uh, it's repetitive to put "read more" underneath every teaser. I know I've often read, and it's been drummed into me to repetitive marketing is this an exercise in repetition. But sometimes from a design aspect, it's nice to, to mix it up. And should we, should we be mixing up the call to actions or should we be consistent? You know, how, do, how do we make things more clickable? Yeah, well, definitely not like in the example you, you've seen with the carnival uh, stuff, uh, because they make like clickable images uh, that doesn't look like a button uh, at first. Uh, what we do here uh, is, yeah, we try to define, I think we go to three sorts of 
different call to action styles. We, of course, uh, start off with a primary call to action, then we create a secondary, and then we, we go to a tertiary, uh, tertiary level, uh, the least. Uh, so yeah, just to put that hierarchy uh, into uh, the design, like I, uh, I told you uh, in the video, the hierarchy here is very important uh, as, as well. Also, uh, a label read more. I tend not to use that because, or I try not to use that. I, I try to make it more, you know, um, how must I say it? For example, if you have like an article uh, about uh, that says, yep. For example, that, that, that is about this Mautic conference. I would not, you know, put a label uh, into the, the, the button like uh, read read more, but maybe make it more personal to the article, make it more uh, fit into the article and say like, uh, read more about Mautic uh, conference uh, 2023. So read more, I, I really, I'm not a fan of that because otherwise like uh, Hugo says, says it's, it's very repetitive and it's not scannable as well. Because it's read more, read more, read more, read more. Uh, you really have to make it or, or try to make it specific uh, to uh, the the item you, uh, yeah, the news article, and uh, it's kind of a more personal way to uh, to reach out for uh, the user as well. Yeah, I hope that Excellent. answers your question, uh, Hugo. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I think Hugo will chip in if he's got uh, another comment there. And uh, yep, yeah, Hugo's Hugo's happy. Great. Um, uh, Dylan, I think uh, I think those are the questions we've got through there. We're going to wrap it up there. Thank you. That was absolutely um, right. absolutely informative for me as someone who's a bit of a design. Um, what's the word? Opposite of a designer, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and realizing how, how important it often is. I don't give it the credit that's deserved. So it's nice to meet someone who's as passionate about it as you are. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we'll probably, if everyone's, anyone wants to connect with, uh, with, with Dylan, I'm sure you can, um, this video will be recorded. Dylan, is there a way people can reach out to you? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm on uh, LinkedIn, uh, of course. You can find me on the Drop Solid uh, uh, website as well with some more uh, contact details to reach out for me. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Thank guys. You. Thank you, you for so having much, me. It was pretty much fun to do this. <laughs> and by amazing. And uh, the next uh, 10, 10 minutes until the next track in this one as well. So stick around for that. And uh, otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of Mordecon 23. And there's uh, two more sessions today. And, uh, of course, we're running tomorrow as well. We'll catch you guys then. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye.